Mr. Thomas, Dr. Morris, everyone, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the workshop on the use of big data in official um, statistics. And also, I would like to say a quick hi, hi everyone. Um, uh, to everyone who is on my stream with us right now. Um, for this afternoon, uh, we are having a forum on technology and innovation for the SDGs. Um, as we constantly emphasize the importance of big data and open data, it is equally significant to talk about how to apply modern open data and big data technologies as a focus to promote social innovation. Um, and you may wonder the connection between um, social innovation and SDGs. Social innovation refers to using innovation methods such as using our technologies and cross-disciplinary cooperation to find effective solutions to social and environmental problems. We hope that social innovation should put foster economic, society, um, environment, and indigenous culture in Taiwan while adhering to the SDGs. Therefore, apart on the application, how social innovation underpins and supports the SDGs will be discussed as well. For this afternoon, we are pleased and extremely honored to invite the speaker today. First, she is Taiwan's very first digital minister in charge of the topic of digital innovation space, a digital service at the national level. Everyone, please welcome Minister Audrey Tan. So yeah, um, really happy to be here to share with you the first few minutes of the many areas of work I'm doing. But the real conversation I think will be with you in a um, 
detection. And so because of that, for the people who have not yet uh, logged into the spider system, I just did so. Yeah, uh, can we turn the light off? Uh, yeah, either scanning the, the common web uh, either scanning the QR code or uh, manually entering the spider that top and entering the data stage um, with two zeros, zero, zero, point oh nine. And so that's the QA platform we can use. I do appreciate the staff who have questions during my talk uh, and vote on each other's questions like the live questions. But the most number of lives uh, will become the topic of our discussion uh, during the QA session. So without further ado, uh, I would like just to introduce uh, a little bit about my work. Um, the moderator has already uh, said, uh, I'm the position in charge of social innovation. And by social innovation, we need to uh, innovations that are not just good for the society, they are like a good for society. We need that everybody can. So I just first want to show you my office. This is the one that I can see the social innovation map. You may or may not have to do it. Please. Um, okay. Oh, no. Okay, there. Right. So, um, in any case, okay. so this is my office, the social innovation lab uh, that you can see. Uh, and this is uh, a co creation of more than 100 social innovators around Taiwan. And just like the soccer field itself is co created by people working with uh, Down syndrome with children and differences. And it turns out that they view the world using a geometric lens that is very different from our numeric or textual lens. And the creations that they uh, make during their visual therapies and art therapies and so on, is then made into public installations so that people enter the space have a lot of very interesting creative vibes. And so um, I want their office hour at the ministry. I have a nice day from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Anybody can just visit me here uh, in the innovation lab and have a real conversation for 40 minutes as long as they agree to have the entire transcript published online. And that's called radical transparency. But it's not just um, humans uh, that visit me, it's also artificial intelligences. Uh, for example, these are self driving tricycles from the MIT lab called persuasive like your vehicles or PEVs. The great thing about these PEVs is that they're very slow, so they take a long time to walk in advance to walk or something like that. And also, it's open source and open software. And that is one key digital situation. It means that anyone can just look at those tricycles and figure out how to integrate it with the and if people see, for example, if you see that only one eye or they say, well, that's not very friendly uh, to the local people, you don't even really don't, uh, just look at a source code and just cut it. And so people can really easily to change it to have two eyes uh, that have meet your eyes and look at you and things like that. And it can very easily fit into the local society. So use the technology instead of having this technology dictate what the society uses. And so this um, runs, uh, I think, very much in tune with uh, our person by the same way when she was inaugurated to ten half years ago, she said before we think democracy was kind of a showdown between opposing bodies. But now democracy must become a diverse conversation between many different bodies. Because when we see emerging technologies, too often uh, it is for example economic development on one side and social welfare on the other. Maybe it's about prosperity on one side, environment on the other, and things like that. And so as public officials, we're like the anonymous group um, torn between different uh, concerns and values. And uh, the government as an officer becomes more and more difficult uh, in our job because here we cannot just set up an agency of uh, 5G, um, AI, um, platform economy, or whatever, whenever an emerging issue happens. So we instead adopt the idea of government as a facilitator. Uh, we ask a different set of questions. Instead of asking, you know, what is um, fair or what is uh, the right position for everybody, we ask first, what are our common values despite our different positions? And even the common values, you know, we deliver innovations that make things better for everyone. And so the government leaves uh, more space for the social and private sector to experiment with creative solutions. For example, advanced regulations that are not yet foreseen by regulators. And so this is, again, a very interesting um, Innovation, I think, it first came from the UK in the form of a internet sandbox. A sandbox means that anyone in the private sector or social tech innovator can ask a um, court, community that uh, they can take the existing regulation and change the regulation to a different direction, like policy makers do. And they can ask the DIA to 
the experiment was their version of the regulation. So that um, we can have a chance to prove the size that it actually uh, works better for everyone. And so the government, which is not the uh, Netherlands system, we actually passed the authorization of the legislation to support all sorts of people that send off this. So on send off or FGTW, anyone can propose that they want to work with them in this way, that are legal or something, that they have to be someone who wants to remain it. And they're all given. Uh, like one year to try out those different modalities on the filter and carbon lines should the visit be seen or things like that. And here we got one year all the way out. Is that it becomes a open innovation attitude, meaning that if the uh, experiment fails uh, at the end of the year, why it fails, the most important the recordings, the um, you know, accountability trail, the data and so on, is shared with the entire public. So the next innovator can learn from the previous failure. But if they, you know, um, be in the heart of the local locality, if you think it's a general way for that, yeah, then after a year, at most two years after it's not up, uh, we adopt the regulation as national regulation. And the great thing about this is that we don't have, as policy makers, we don't have to regulate something that we don't have for science experiences, where everybody can see how it's been like for a year before we decide how to regulate it. And anytime the MPs can decide, oh, we want to wait for the funding and make a law that was a very Technology and they're given at most three or four years to do so. But while they're doing the task, uh, the innovator can continue to run their business. And so essentially, they limit some of how they do that, but else is still illegal. Uh, but of course, at the end, some people will end still active in the markets. And so, of course, by this time, um, the point I have to read the fine print, meaning that although every ministry, every regulation is fair game for our sandbox um, regulation innovation in Taiwan, there's two. Um, Policies that are not fair uh, to, to try. Uh, you cannot submit an experiment on, on water, and you can also, you know, fund terrorism. But uh, the other, other than those two, everything is fair. But how do we discover the science of this? Uh, another great thing in Taiwan is that we have brought that as human rights. But now we mean that anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have access to the megabits, this cycle is personally my fault. Uh, and, and because of that, we have very affordable 4G. Uh, in most of the cities, a uh, limited 4G uh, data network is less than 20 years old. Uh, and so, because of that, anywhere in Taiwan, we have pretty good public connection that can enable this kind of live streaming and media conversation as we very regularly use them. Uh, the lecture is being lost. And so, because of that, I tour personally around Taiwan for the education of the rural, the you know, remote islands and things like that, and talk to the local co ops and social enterprises, the indigenous families, and so on, and to discover the real social needs and to fit that with those uh, sample innovators. But while I do that, in the social innovation lab in Taipei, all the 12 different ministries are in Taipei, but they still meet at a virtual IUI. So that is not just me who travels, I uh, bring a kind of virtual garage uh, that is a lot of different ministries. And the great thing about this is that for the many local people, when they apply a, a case to the Ministry of the Interior, some kind of material will say, oh, I'll have to consult with the Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Health and Welfare or things like that. But now they cannot say that anymore because they're literally sitting next to each other. And so they have to brainstorm and deliver something. And after, you know, uh, 10 working days, about two weeks after each week, we publish the full transcript. So the next thing we in the next city or next town can use that as their original long validation plan. And so they kind of add to each other on the policy making context. So this kind of continuous integration of discovering local means again advocates the official innovation that we uh, deliver here in Taiwan. And any um, like self driving vehicles or green energy or any other innovations are uh, also considered. Um, this is uh, like the zoo, uh, the Shaolin Park in Energy Sun City. Uh, it's um, just outside of uh, high speed rails. And so, the great thing about Taiwan is that high speed rails on the north coast to the south coast is just an hour and a half. So, in that case, anyone uh, in the Taiwan can very easily go to the Parapara uh, in the Shaolin Park Energy Sun City and have a percent experience of how this upcoming technology is integrated with the society and so on. And so, uh, you would know that I said, you know, by the end of the experiment or at the beginning of the innovation, we ask people whether they like the idea or not. But how do we actually listen to tens of thousands of people when we use AI to moderate? And so, this is actually from the very beginning of the use of the technology that we regularly put to use here called OS. Uh, 
uh, your LDIs. And this is an open source technology that anyone can post to the sales or app. I think it does very country as well. We have many partnerships um, with other countries. And it basically um, shows the avatar of the uh, citizen and their um, relative position on one particular issue with all their social media and values. And basically, that's a low impact. Because unlike traditional internet forums, they are not nameless enemies, right? They just spread their values. We have to host different opinions. And so to run a consultation like this, we use what we call a focus conversation method, uh, which is the facts and feelings and invitations or ideas and decisions that are our ID method. So on the first step, we crowdsource the data, it's not just open common data, but also open citizen data. And given the same data, the same objective facts, um, people are then asked, what do you feel about it? And there's no right or wrong right? about the same fact, you know, you can't be it. Angry is all okay, but it gives a monster people to resonate with each other's feelings. Then we ask for ideas. The best ideas are the ones that take care of the most people's feelings. And finally, we took the best ideas that are coherent with each other and tr translate them into the goal. So here's the point. For example, this is in our uh, very first step driving uh, 10 months publication. And once you're getting into this open place, you're given a fellow a citizen's comment and you can agree or disagree with it. And once you click the rear degree, of course, you're ever find this to where the people that share your positions. But the great thing about this interface is that there is no reply button. What we have discovered is that if you do have a reply button, it drops the dominant the conversation. People can attack each other, they can post cat pictures or things like that. But in any case, if you don't have a reply button and if you don't agree with the statement, the best you can do is to press disagree and then share your own reflection, trying to be more support or your fellow so uh, all our design cases, such as POTUS, such as the e Division platform, such as Slido that you're using now, don't have a reply button, right? So if you think the questions aren't good, they will only recourse is asking a better question. And so if there's one people waiting on my slides, I wanted to do this slide. Um, this slide, I think, is very significant. Uh, it shows that at the end of each consultation, we always get a shape like this. If you only look at popular media and some social media, you would think that this slide relies on state dominates the entire society's attention and discussion. But actually, given a, a reflective space like this, people can discover collectively that most people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things in the time. And we can just translate this, what we call love consensus, into ideas and regulations without getting bogged down by those demands and statements, by those uh, essential ideologies. And so this is how we deal with it in relations. That fits the right consensus, and we know that um, this was everybody. And so, um, all of these technologies are not actually developed by the Taiwan government. It is developed by the Taiwan Shadow government, uh, the, the Gap Zero movement. And this is a movement that I'm uh, a part of. Uh, it starts in 2012. And the very beginning, which is the domain name, the internet domain name, called G0B.PW. And the idea is very simple. For the Taiwan Public Service website and services, and with something that GOV that we have, which is like your country, probably a GOV or something, right? And so basically, for each of the government services that their citizens, the city hackers don't like, or think they can do better, they can fork the government and do a similar or the same service using the same Wi Fi address, but just changing an O to a zero. So you don't have to place every class that people don't have to discover or search for anything. They just go to a government website, change an O to a zero, and get into the shell government. Which uh, you know is more interactive, delivers a better um, experience, like the, the overall project, the visualization of the national budget, and people can have a real time discussion on each and every drill down part of the budget that they care about. And the great thing about the zero is that all the copyright is relinquished to this open source. So on the next performance cycle, if the government thinks that work is a good one, then we just merge it up, and then we discover that oh, everybody really likes this. Um, budget visualization. So now we incorporate it in our national participation platform. It's called Join um, that GOV, the EW. So we just merge the Gap Zero contribution pack to our e participation platform, which now has 5 million or so users out of 23 million. How these people can enable people to just get a real kind of conversation based on the actual facts of the KPIs, procurements, all those deliverables of the thousands of national ministerial projects. And the career public service can answer publicly and directly to the citizens' inquiries without getting uh, bogged down by the intermediaries such as um, you know, and journalists. The NPN journalists can have their point of view. They don't have to be the gatekeepers of 
between citizens and uh, public service. And so I'll just use one last example. This is another death zero movement uh, project called the Airbox project. And the Airbox project, I think, is quite unique because it is really an uh, inexpensive IoT data collection device. Anyone, like students also, can use less than 100 US dollars to purchase a PM 2.5 uh, air quality sensor that uh, measures the air quality of your balcony, schools, and everything. But the great thing about this is knowing is that it's not just measuring for itself. People contribute to the public distributed ledger, otherwise known as blockchain, uh, so that people know that we cannot do things, we cannot change each other's number, and people can trust each other's um, number to be you know, at least not compromised. And so um, the citizen science community now has more than 2,000 points that complements our national uh, air monitoring uh, association. And now many um, nearby countries ask me when I go to the SDG related conferences, like how can we allow 2,000 people to challenge the legitimacy of the government because if the government's number is different, um, the citizen's number is of course the citizens want to trust their friends' numbers. And but in Taiwan, because we have absolutely each other's assembly, we cannot be there, so we join them. And so we instead ask systematically what where they feel are our answer to those standards. For example, in the industrial talks, maybe the citizen scientists cannot answer, but the lamps uh, are owned by the state, so we can install air boxes right into the lamps uh, in the industrial plant areas. Or even the citizen scientists feel that they want a sense of guilt to measure uh, the domestic versus, uh, you know, cost the street. Uh, air policy uh, influences, uh, but they cannot actually set up a mission to us yet. But we can just for building, you know, offshore wind plants, and so we can add it to the wind plant contract and things like that. So just by uh, joining the citizen science uh, community, we contribute to all over the world because it's open source on the hardware. Anyone can just download and very easily sort of, you know, air, air box. And so this is international. And we set up a what we call a zero IoT of what technologies for both the technology will be equally. That um, basically anything that doesn't have a privacy concern and the environmental is collected into this real time API um, website that people can just very easily view uh, and make their own transition with construction contributions. And so we every year host a presidential hackathon uh, that discovers um, hundreds of cases from among society. And we use projected voting, it's a new voting system that allocates every citizen a hundred points. For uh, one vote, you spend one point, two votes, four points, three votes, nine points, like the projected um, increasing. And so people can very carefully select the cases that they feel are of social impact. Those select like 20 cases to judge that we coach them uh, along a three months uh, process into what we call tribal board teams. Each team contains an ever data expert, a domain expert, and a regulator expert, sometimes uh, actually always a public service. And so we make sure that these kind of things. Ensure the feasibility of these ideas. And like the last uh, year's winner, one of the funders used machine learning to detect water leakage um, very effectively. After three months of waiting for the business cup, they were then trying to do well in such a new field to solve the same problem, to adapt the climate change there, to solve the water, water shortage. And so the first uh, prize winners, the finance of each year, don't have any money uh, associated with the prize. Instead, they're given a trophy uh, by the president himself. And trophy is a Projected. If you turn it on, it projects the image of the present animal. Wow. It's very useful in internal negotiations because it um, signifies the presidential promise that no matter what it takes, after the three months demo approved concept, we're committed to, after nine more months, to adopt that idea into the public service and fund it indefinitely using public budget and adapting any regulation that we need to uh, adapt. Basically, uh, the commitment too much is the price of the presidential mm -hmm. uh, and we deliver on that for all the five cases that we've done one uh, last year. And so through this, uh, we want to share that when we talk about partnership of folks, we're not just uh, solving our domestic issues, but rather through this data collection is sharing this kind of uh, technologies for collaboration, for listening skills and so on uh, with the world so that we can uh, achieve the same goals together and indeed that is what we mean by how we can help. And so, uh, just to summarize my role as digital minister, primarily focus on the targets is to make class availability of reliable data so people can have a real conversation. Instead of uh, you know, arguing over basic facts, we can base on basic facts and share each other's feelings. And then we do effective partnerships through the, through the touring, through the sandbox system, and so on. And we ensure using our regulation that all these things 
are open innovation and really accessible for uh, future innovators. And so my job description uh, is very short. Uh, as a vision minister, is that Poland, so uh, I'm really to you now, and it goes like this. So we see internet of things. Let's make it an internet of things. Or we see virtual reality. Let's make it a shared reality. Or we see machine learning. Let's make it collaborative learning. Or we see user experience. Let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is let's always remember the morality of this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tong. So next, um, we would like to welcome um, his current consultant of the Global Master of Development Practice Secretaries at the Earth Institute in Columbia University. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Mark Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Audrey. Um, always great to hear from you. Um, I have a slide with Audrey. <laughs> we'll be getting there shortly. Um, all right. Um, so I'll be uh, relying primarily on this PowerPoint, but I will be switching to some websites. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to do that here. Okay. Um, and I'm going to start today by introducing you to this uh, global classroom uh, that I help facilitate um, for the Master's of Development Practice program. Um, and then I'm going to take you through some other uh, resources that I hope to be of use to you. Um, please let me know if these are things you're already completely aware of and you spend more time on other topics. Um, I'm going to end with one of my favorite um, case studies of technology uh, being used uh, in a for profit uh, business model context for social innovation. Um, so, uh, every fall, uh, which is about September to uh, December um, in the United States, um, during the fall term, uh, the Global Masters of Development Practice Program, which is now up to about 35 um, universities worldwide, uh, started at Columbia in 2008. Uh, this is a master program that prepares uh, students to work in policy, work in the field as practitioners of sustainable development. Um, they wanted to find a way to meet as a network um, through a classroom atmosphere every week. Um, and for that, they started uh, back in 2007 as a program that we launched, experimenting with online um, technologies um, to create a virtual classroom where everybody could participate. Um, so, this is um, the program that I uh, help facilitate. Um, here in the next slide, you can see it is uh, one of our guest speakers from 2018. Minister Audrey Tang right here, um, giving um, her presentation and then using Slido um, to engage the classroom worldwide um, in their um, discussion. Um, so we use the Zoom video conferencing platform, uh, which is a most bandwidth platform that can be used all over the world, um, even in some of our more remote locations in Botswana and Madagascar um, and elsewhere, uh, to provide clear connection for everyone. Um, and this is led out of Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, we approach the class as a 13 week uh, semester. We have a different guest speaker every week. Um, and these guest speakers are, are people like uh, uh, Minister Tang, um, who are leaders in their field, um, who we otherwise would not be able to expose ourselves either as a classroom um, or as individuals or in the group. So we bring these people uh, to, the, to the forefront. We, we always start with Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Um, who is a leader in the Sustainable Development um, Network and um, is a writer of Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and we bring others uh, like Professor Sachs in every week. Um, we group these, these speakers by, by the pillars approach. Um, we start with three folks who are going um, to take deep dives into the economic pillar, followed by environment, um, social inclusion, and finally governance, governance for sustainability. Um, and the idea is to get these top notch speakers and bring them in um, to make these uh, decentralized presentations uh, throughout the network. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly here to show you a little bit more. Uh, I'm not going to show you a brief presentation because you 
But just so you know that this website exists, um, the PowerPoint will be shared with those in the room. Uh, so you can just click on the links. Otherwise, you can enter globalclass2019.com and it will be redirected to the site. Um, and here you can see our archive of, of past lectures from both 2018 and 2017. We have Professor Sachs here. We have uh, Johan Rostrom, um, who is a leader of the planetary boundaries concept, which I'll talk to you more about tomorrow. Um, and we've got an ad block here. Um, and, and, and some others um, uh, throughout the field. Um, and 2018, um, and some other information. So these are all available to you now by just typing in global class. 2018.com, you can be re redirected into the archive of, of our previous lecture from previous speakers. Um, now I have to find out how to get that. So uh, that's a very quick overview of the global platform itself, um, which is just one example of using some technology innovation and in bring um, a coordinated discussion and conversation about sustainable development to be massive of development practice focus. Uh, here's our lineup for next year. Um, the asterisks are confirmed that we're still working on some of the others. So you see again we have the science teaching it off. We have Professor Esther Duclo of MIT um, with somewhat different perspective on sustainable development from Professor Sachs. Um, we try to engage in those kinds of alternate uh, discussions. Uh, we have a special session from the United Nations General Assembly this year with um, Dr. David Smith, who is um, out of the University of West Indies in Jamaica and is one of the authors of the Global Sustainable Development Report 2019. Um, we were fortunate last year that our students participated in a policy brief competition to the class where they were able to submit policy briefs for inclusion in the GSDR 2019. Um, we have Johan Rastrom's partner, Will Stephan, uh, one of his co-authors, um, to be the planetary boundaries discussion next year, and uh, we're hoping for the Prime Minister of New Zealand to talk about social inclusion. Um, uh, Congress, young Congresswoman from New York, uh, to talk about governance and sustainable development. Again, we have Mr. Tang and some others, um, Mr. Ken Robinson, who has been on education. So these are just some examples of the pages that we have. Um, we have some hopes for, for changing up the global classroom in the future. I don't think Going into these details too much right now, um, but we do have issues with time zones. Um, we have on the line uh, Beijing and China, where it's about 10 p.m. at night when we're doing global classroom, and we have universities who cannot participate because it's 5 or 6 a.m. in California at the same time. Um, we're looking to have interaction so that it's not just a shared kind of conversation, but also a collaborative environment working together. Um, and we hope to open this up to a wider audience. Of course, um, you all here are welcome to join at any time. Uh, the link next year will be Global Class 2019. Um, so that's a quick overview of just one little resource. And, and actually, the main maybe connection for why I'm here and, and ended up here, but I want to talk about some other resources for you. Um, again, so many times this is something you all know about or have talked about, and I'll give them some other points. Um, there's something that the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and then talk more about some of the resources they have for you when it comes to big data and open data. Um, one of their resources is called SDG Academy, which is a collection of massive, massive open online courses from world leading experts on sustainable development topics. Um, today they have uh, 25 courses, and they're, they're working on more to be introduced. Um, they have a variety, of, uh, some are instructor based you're actually going week by week with the um, instructors. Um, and then they have self-paced courses, which are usually on their own pace, pre-recorded lectures, less um, dynamic, less live. And then they also have a category where they break these down by SDG. So I'm going to click on this in a second, and we'll see how that works. Um, they've already reached over 200,000 students from over 190 territories. Uh, so let me just bring up the actual website. And you've got a course listing uh, all 25. Um, so you see this one is uh, Human Rights and Human Laws. It's a structure case, which means there's a start date, specific start date, which is January 14th, and it lasts for a specific time. And you can see it addresses these SDGs, uh, number five, gender equality, and number 16, these um, institutions and uh, other topics. So you can see how they're, they're divided by those um, topics. Um, you can also click here and say, okay, I want to learn about clean water and sanitation. 
Um, what courses do we have to offer on clean water and sanitation? And can we do water addresses the global flood crisis? Let me pick one that's more has more courses. Um, where is hunger? Zero hunger. There we go. Number two um, has a number of courses uh, related to agriculture. Uh, or two at least. Feeding a hungry plant is one, and then sustainable food system. We don't believe there's a, a self pick. Well, this one's a self pick. Um, so that's an overview of courses. Let's just go quickly back to all the courses so you can see. Um, I'll bring some directly to your attention. Um, there are some that are specifically related to the SDG. How to achieve the SDGs. This is an archived uh, course um, from Professor Sachs. Um, here's another course I highly encourage you to complete in sustainable development. Um, tomorrow, when I'm with you for a few hours in the morning, um, we'll be talking a lot about the different challenges of sustainable development, but this course will be a much more in depth um, review of those. Um, and that's just a very quick um, overview of the SDG Academy. Um, as I mentioned, SDG Academy is part of this United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. How many of you have heard of the SDSN or have worked with them? Okay, so this is a great resource for you that um, as you go to your home countries and, and, and see how you can work for data and monitoring and evaluation. Um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network is a partnership um, with uh, the United Nations Secretariat, um, and they have a variety of different projects. SDG Academy is one of them. Um, another one is these 12 thematic networks, um, which vary to deep decarbonization and health and education. Um, the one that's most appropriate for the topic of this workshop is the Thematic Research Network on Data and Statistics, also known as Trends. Um, and as you can read here, this um, is, is a, a, a network of folks who are looking for ways um, to help um, facilitate the use of data, of monitoring, and evaluation um, to achieve the SDGs at a local setting. So these are really intended for folks uh, just like you. Um, they also have 11 solutions in this report. Um, and three of these are directly tied to data and ME. So let me just take you there so we can see what those are. Um, so here are all their various solutions in this report, including the deep decarbonization pathway projects. This is an example of, of a project where your goal was how can we get our country to uh, neutral carbon by 2050, let's say, um, you would be doing this solution initiative. Um, but there are many that are good, devoted to data. One is data reconciliation. Uh, this may be of interest to the group here. Um, another is local data action, which might be of interest to many of you here. And then finally, uh, open algorithm projects. So uh, within those solution initiatives, there are three devoted uh, exactly to the, the topic of this workshop um, for which you are all here uh, this week. Um, finally, um, one other category um, of the SDSN, they actually they were formed before the creation of the Sustainable Development Goals, and they did a lot of the legwork um, to emphasizing the importance of monitoring, evaluation, follow-up, and review, having appropriate indicators, of which there are 230 indicators um, in 169 targets of 17 sustainable development goals. Um, so they did a lot of that legwork like, to help decide what they did and what didn't and how we can measure things. Um, so I encourage you to visit uh, the site. Um, and here are three different um, projects within this one subset of the SDSN related to data indicators and public review. Um, the first is the kind of the the launch paper itself, I mentioned it on this one, um, but it, it has a lot of useful information for how we got to where we are um, with the indicators and with the target. Um, and then here are a couple that are more appropriate, perhaps, for, for you all. Um, one is data for development, need assessment, SDG monitoring, and statistical capacity development. And then the final one I'll click on here is the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So if you weren't familiar with this partnership, anyone here familiar with this partnership? Um, <laughs> you. Um, so this, I think, will be important for you all. This is, you know, this is a nice uh, community uh, resource for you all to partner with, um, to work with. And this is all coming out of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And then I linked to this, uh, in my slide, I, I linked to this TED Talk too, which might be interesting to you, um, or might be helpful to you as you try to convince people of why you're working important or why what you're doing. 
uh, matters. Um, and there's a TED talk called Lack of Data in the Issue of Global Justice. Um, it's amazing the, the resources that you just heard about here in Prep Walker. I said they connect you with your own home country if you don't have the same kind of resources or a digital literature or access to a minimum of 10 KB per second uh, bandwidth. So, um, Oh, and maybe like, even better. <laughs> um, so that made this a little talk. Um, finally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a case study, um, an example of using technology for social innovation. Um, and it comes out of Kenya, uh, where I do a lot of work on the map, so most of my work is focused in sub Saharan Africa. And this happens to be actually like a for profit business model. It's, these are not people who got into the business for the social impact or the environmental impact. Um, they got into it for the profit fund, the single bottom line, not the triple bottom line. Um, and yet, it's an example of using technology for amazing um, social innovation and impact. Um, and the challenge that they were trying to solve, and I'm going to be a little interactive here with you all in the room, um, was that of Paris and lanterns. Um, this is the primary challenges in, in less developed countries uh, like Kenya. Um, but for those of you who may not be familiar, many rural um, Africans are not connected um, to any kind of electric grid or um, have access to solar panels or other technologies and therefore need to re rely on uh, kerosene as fuel or light. Um, so here are some pictures of kids doing their homework um, by a kerosene lamp. Um, and while this may not be applicable in your country, um, I want, what I would rather you understand is how uh, technology is being used in an innovative way um, to achieve tremendous impact related to a variety of areas. And so I'm going to ask the audience here if you can think what SDGs from the top of your head, um, and if you don't remember them by number, uh, just by general broad topic, um, what are they, what, where are Paris' Um, yes. I mean, well, education. 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 Okay. So environment. That's a big one. Environment is another one. Poverty. Poverty. Health. 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 Maybe health. There are some topics. So I actually didn't put health here. Um, energy is another one. So access to energy is a key challenge here, right? Education is indirectly affected because it does impact their students' ability to study for a certain time or in a certain uh, level of standard. Uh, poverty, of course, and then it actually poverty as well as we'll see. Right, so what's the opportunity here? The opportunity is that to get this um, kerosene, people are spending about 50 shillings, so about 50 cents a day for the limited amount of kerosene um, that they are using, which is actually a pretty significant part of income for a poor rural household. Um, so that means that you can somehow capture this market where people are paying 50 shillings a day or something and replace it with something else, and that will be a big breakthrough. What do you think is the big technological breakthrough to, in, in this scenario? This is a bit of a trick question. And we'll do that. Some of those things will go bigger. So, okay, so yeah, the, the, the first thought is that the big um, technology here is to replace this kerosene with another technology from solar energy. And that is true, but that's been um, something in a decade of problem where we've had NGOs going out in the world trying to find ways to have um, these low region people access um, something like a solar lantern and oftentimes the direct solution. The real technology here that made this possible to work and the reason why this happens in Kenya and not somewhere else or the study to grow into other places, the real technological breakthrough is other mobile money which is the ability to send money cheaply and easily from something as basic as a flip phone, uh, which are prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then the electronic technology of SIM cards that you can actually deactivate the functioning of a lantern or a solar panel remotely if someone does not submit their mobile money payment. And without these, it's very hard to capture the, the funds. It's very expensive to capture the fact that these people pay 50 cents a day and why don't they just invest in dollars solar lanterns? Well, they don't have that. They don't have that money. That's the definition of being poor up front. Um, and it's hard to enforce and collect um, the 50 cents per day unless you have a way to do it costlessly, go through the process and pay for a mobile money payment. And then if they default, if they don't pay, they switch the system off, costlessly, and cheaper. Um, which is what they do for M-Proba. 
So COBA actually is to borrow in this one theory. The name of this company emphasizes the fact that this is a credit access challenge more than it is any other type of technological challenge. And that's where the technology comes in, um, along with, of course, the solar panels being cheaply accessible and affordable and reliable. Um, but so here's what it looks like with uh, the system in place. This is the regular um, basic lamp system that Infoba distributes. Um, and they collect money by those, pe those people who were paying 50 shillings a day to take care of the team. So they now pay 50 shillings a day directly to Infoba using a mobile money account. And then Infoba just shuts it off if they don't pay back. Um, and then when they do pay, they shut it back off. And so it's not a firm thing. Here is the impact of this, this small uh, or, and growing uh, um, innovation, technological innovation has had on social and environmental impact. This is as of last January, so in the year it's grown even more, and I know, although I don't have the latest figures, over 600,000 homes have been connected with without solar power. When you think of the NGOs out there that trying to distribute solar energy, they've never reached this kind of critical mass, and these are, these are actually doing it for a problem. 600,000 connected to affordable solar power. They save money because they no longer, once they own the system, they own the system, they no longer pay that energy so in the day. Um, those households will estimate, or estimate, say, uh, $450 million over four years, save 75 million hours of kerosene to pay lighting per month, um, 780,000 tons of CO2 that they use, and 2,500 jobs that get created and kind of through this. In addition, we have, I know I read through your biography of mine, some of you are working with cell phone data and other um, techniques of collecting information. They're able to offer these people a credit score for how reliable they are as repayers. And this gives them a further um, leg up in, this, in the current system. Um, and they also are collecting local solar resources, very similar to what I've just done with the air monitor. Um, they're able to go household to household to say how much solar radiation an area is getting, which is very important. To climate insurance on a very micro scale, um, or farmers insurance, which I think is something you guys will be looking at um, in the near future. Then they're able to leverage the fact that we can shut off your electricity at any time if you don't pay to give you access to things that we can't shut off, like bicycles, cook stoves, um, smartphones, um, or other things we can shut off, like TV, which is a very popular thing. So these are new, new products that they can offer existing customers because they have a way of uh, turning off the power um, and exposing those people if they need help to some kind of challenge. Here's the household. They've got the light, they've got the TV, they've got the radio, and they're going to try and it's very um, But so this company is using the for-profit model to achieve this. Um, I'm not going to go into the business model on campus today, um, maybe tomorrow. Um, but so that's an example um, that I just wanted to share with you from my own work. Um, since I will be with you, Tomorrow, um, what would be helpful for me as I kind of find some of presentation um, is to somehow over the next couple of hours point to you um, what indicators are most relevant to your own work, or what are your own challenges related to this kind of information. Um, for example, what do you already have funding access to, or what do you need uh, better access to, or is this some access to? So, um, that's something we keep in mind as we're conversing over the next hour. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for our uh, fellow uh, outstanding uh, uh, speakers. Uh, right now, we are moving on to our Q&A section. Um, I believe that um, you guys remember the, the last week we did the Ministry of Interior we applied the Slido, right? So we use this Slido as well. So you might want to. So um, and for the viewers who is on live stream with us, and you are more than welcome to join us for the discussion as well. But please, apart from using Slido, you may like, raise your hand and raise the question in, in traditional way with the tap phone. So, okay. so we have seven questions, but nobody has any likes. So remember, you, you should be <laughs> liking <laughs> liking seven questions so that the one you really want to hear for those of you who uh, didn't submit a question, uh, rise to the top. Yeah. And, and we 
raise your hand always takes my RPO. <laughs> 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 is there anyone? Or, or do we just, oh, yeah. There are some now. Okay. So, um, somewhat appropriately, the first most likely question is what are the fail safe mechanisms in place to prevent hijacking of those? Um, so, in the case of Slido, there's no mechanism because uh, we're going to answer all the odd questions in the answer. It's relatively important. And so, because there's no fail safe mechanism. But um, in terms of the potential mechanism, then, of course, there is a fail safe mechanism. It's basically uh, anyone must uh, take a box that says I have a resident certificate or I have a national uh, I want. Uh, and then we use two factor. Uh, one is the SMS and the other is social media or email authentication. And you have to have all of those different uh, applications before you get a token and you are just taking for your ability. It's not 100% bulletproof, but if someone tries to systematically register like 5,000 SMS number, who actually can go? So, um, but, but of course, the, 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 because again, the binding power is not that much. If the binding power is long, the like in the then we actually have to use the national uh, the citizen digital certificate, is our national uh, PR card. I think at the moment we're at maybe like 20 something percent, almost 30 percent uh, penetration. So, that, uh, around one in four people in Taiwan have a PR enabled card, and they have to use that for the uh, signature for referendum. The starting uh, late next year, we will roll out the PR functionality as part of the national ID card. So then we expect the vast majority of citizens will have access to the PI um, cards just like as they will be starting uh, late next year. And there's a question about the cost. One of the main reasons that Tala doesn't have a new startup yet. Uh, we, we have a promise in the cost like 90% here, it's called the world. Um, and you, you may have heard of it. it it's a, uh, what, what they call the Tesla for motorcycles. Uh, so basically, they just roll out their new product, actually, to go on the street. And considering bombing one, not that I would uh, you know, have much time to run on scooters. But, but it is pretty attractive, right? Um, after all the government subsidies uh, and uh, like environmental separate programs, each of those all electric track or 170 km uh, scooters uh, is, I think, just a thousand and one hundred US dollars, which is really cheap. You know, and, uh, um, and there's a pretty good swappable uh, battery platform. And so I think this is very helpful. Uh, it solves a important uh, sustainable development goal, actually, at the core of SDG related issues related to um, like the carbon footprint of a home health infrastructure and things like that. But while it also uses advanced battery technologies to add in to other like such as vehicles. Drones or whatever, all use the same battery technologies that as the world is currently developing. And so it ties into the global battery um, and renewable energy uh, supply chain as well. And so, yeah, I don't think it is a problem for, for us to take longer to have a um, unicorn that actually creates positive environmental and social externalities. Uh, we don't in Taiwan um, overemphasize the economic um, bottom line to the detriment of the um, environmental and the social bottom lines. So when they get almost in the level, you almost always see that they are actually uh, think for good and not just for good in the science sense, but their core business is also an important plan to uh, problem. And so that is why we're taking on the right of this process because otherwise we have to, you know, use other things very much because not just problems created by the economics of this. But anyway, yes. Um, okay. But what are some other uses of blockchain in this presentation? Um, quite a few actually. So um, in, in Taiwan, I prefer the term distributed ledger technology or the real thing, mostly because it describes the, the actual core value of the technology, not the particular information of blocks and chains, right? So it's just like saying search engines in the Google that is an idea. Uh, but it, of course, we agree with the blockchain. Uh, and so uh, we deploy real things whenever there is a general distrust between a diverse open ended set of players um, who don't otherwise trust each other on their numbers. And so the air quality measurement is a really good example because people would not trust actually each other, uh, and especially the national happy computing center could not temper with their reported air quality numbers the day before the election because of the verified issue here in the local elections. 
But if they are actually uploaded to the distributed ledger, some of you are comfortable with the national ID, publishing analysis or helping our consultants uh, about an analysis simply because they know that for all the GPUs that the NCM speed that has been given in the past, they can all actually convert the, the open and the distributed ledger's numbers. And so anything that uh, requires accountability, they can do it at the moment too. Um, and so um, in my line of work, which is social innovation and technology, uh, there's, there's quite a few social engineers that use the um, distributed ledgers to track, for uh, example, crowdfunding uh, over the internet. So there is a popular uh, social enterprise here called Google Current, which is just like uh, Kickstarter or uh, Indiegogo, which is a crowdfunding platform, but uh, it is very much um, popular uh, to use it for international um, aid, like this one is done um, and um, to help the value um, piece here. And all the donations, you can track the actual growth across international boundaries. Um, of course, they, I think they still talk with the to, to do the four account builds, but this real ledger is the way to very easily reach the real time show um, who is donating and where the, the, the money flows um, and when it actually reaches the people that it's supposed to um, to help. And again this still seems makes the point of the real time report uh, a, a full accountable uh, trail uh, using professional technique is it, great but it's a small story yes uh, and we still do that but it also provides reliable snapshot right literally every minute or so um, and so people can generally say oh you don't have to rely on physical if they fail, actually, you can reconstruct the money uh, flow um, on the Ethereum public distributed uh, ledger. And so that is a another you know, uh, use. There's many other uses, like there's an experimental um, idea I think being proposed uh, about the migrant workers um, who, uh, before they travel to Taiwan to apply for their job, they first uh, write their contract and they not really smart contract, it's just a contract, uh, into the public distributed ledger. So that's the, the they, they won't be uh, made a switch when they uh, come to Taiwan and have to agree on another uh, contract. Uh, and I'll mention later it's going to be a and then we'll find out. And so just and anywhere where the company is going to be able to apply to the technologies. Uh, so the next question is uh, related to the solar power great question. How do they um, charge their phones in the first place if they don't have access to power? Um, the reality is that um, there is usually a site nearby where they can charge their phones, so they're actually paying um, to have their phone charged at a kiosk, uh, maybe a kilometer or more away from their home, or maybe at the local village. Um, so remember, these are very basic phones, these are those uh, flip phones from kids. Um, so they go to the kiosk and they pay to have it charged for an hour or more, um, and then they can use it um, for very basic functions. Um, but so if they're able to get their system, it comes to the phone charger itself, uh, so it's a much more benefit uh, of these systems in their homes. And then you can see how it uh, becomes a virtuous cycle. Um, and actually, then once you have the system, you can start selling your charging services like to others. Um, but it, in general, it just uh, creates a virtual cycle, virtual cycle where you're redistributing income that was going to uh, somewhere um, that it doesn't need to go. Um, to somewhat better um, and providing you with a much higher quality of life, um, higher chance of living and access eventually to these other goods, um, which is one of the real beauties of the Imagine if it was just limited to lighting, that would be great. Um, but when you can then tie that lighting uh, to other goods by getting a credit rating um, and also by um, having access to goods that you otherwise wouldn't be able to control remotely, like a lighting system. Um, now you can do that through the lighting. Um, so that's a uh, great question. Um, so I see that people uh, are busy talking to you. So, how can you build better policies that help technology, give technology in a very quick way? I think that the core thing here is to, to uh, make sure that the technology is appropriate. Um, and the perfect technology, of course, is a very fresh trend in the decade is no longer fresh now. But uh, I think it, it really captures the spirit of innovation is not necessarily like new in the world, not when you look at the pilot pattern everywhere. 
it only has to be made in that particular locality to solve that particular social economic social issue. And if we have a kind of holistic view of this, which is a simple country that we're inventing, um, then we can innovate quickly but still maintain our own goals. And once we have the common goals, I think all the regulations are are fair game for people to to amend, to challenge, to apply the same law that we might get. But the common goals, the common vision, or in design thinking terms, the common how might be question, that must be figured out first. So um, every time uh, we run this uh, collaborative workshops, um, we always use a uh, kind of design thinking um, methodology, and I'm just going to uh, show you one of our um, um, slides. Um, sorry that it's not translated, uh, but basically uh, this is about uh, our universal healthcare uh, card uh, and how to digitalize it, virtualize that card. So that you can be coming to our code or NFC or whatever on um, people's phones. And but it, it's very important before the technologies enter the space, we actually understand how is it for the people to think about their interaction with medical services and then figure out the same how might be question. And so actually we ran all the table the competition in Korea that to get into the point and how might we accelerate the access to universal healthcare and insurances regardless of whether they're online or offline, remote or in the towns, countryside and things like that. And and we list the method as not of that services before we actually deliver the solutions. And so that way uh, we can assist, for example, uh, many vendors trying to push facial recognition uh, to us. Uh, but we can go back to the home ID question to come on and say um, nowhere in this um, common values do we mention that uh, you know um, that it needs facial recognition technology. Certainly, it should be enough. It may make the personalized application faster, but it's not correspondent to the actual uh, core value that we have identified throughout the operation workshops. And that is how we assist the, the vendors to uh, try to get uh, the country, the state, to stand by their side while they advance their own agenda with recognition technology. And not Philosophical against that technology, and to say if you have a multiple prototype and you would be on the priorities first, then you can innovate the only on the technology that fit those priorities, meaning that they are appropriate. And I think that is the, the kind of public defense uh, where we're uh, looking into the sort of the state having to help technology. Technology is just a, a name, it's not an end, and the end is a commodity that is sort of uh, the societal um, path. Um, that we like this space and let everybody see and observe and uh, contribute to it. So then the council and I think this one is on the end. The, uh, the well, I mean, uh, um, so whether you're aware of it or not, that's the second question we've asked that they just feedback loops a little bit. Um, because if technology is changing um, and we're using that same technology to help change technology, right? How does that kind of work? Um, so it's, it's fascinating that you're testing on these things, um, suddenly or, or, or otherwise. Um, but I would just add to that that the policies that help facilitate innovation uh, themselves might be more constant, maybe or less dynamic. Um, if the end goal is to, to bring about creativity, uh, to bring about innovation, to bring about collaboration, that policy might change less frequently than the things that come from it. Um, and I think the real question the policy and innovation is when are we creating policies that incentivize innovation towards the, the real challenges of sustainable development? Um, or are we creating policies that incentivize um, innovation and towards things that are maybe less, uh, less important? Um, we like to um, take Uber as a target in the United States because the origin story of Uber is. Um, uh, relatively wealthy upper class kids in San Francisco were tired of not being able to get a taxi on a Friday night, and that was the origin story for Uber. That said, Uber is going on to transform um, a lot of lives, um, for better or for worse, um, and, and, and has spillover effects. But are we setting up incentives for innovation that are targeting kind of real challenge that are bringing more people into the conversation, uh, which is really I think, the beauty of the work of, of the of, of Minister um, Pang here um, is they're they're creating they're not just creating policy for any kind of innovation but they're targeting those innovations towards outcomes that are related to sustainable development and through processes 
and methodologies that are collaborative, that are balanced, um, that point out that we have more in common than we have you know, just the five people at the end who are really controversial while the majority of us are trying to find these things together. Um, so I think uh, don't feel confused the policy maybe for the, with the actual technology. Right. Um, three people would like to know for non binary issues, are likely some choices conflict in the continuum? Um, this question I think is best answered uh, visually. So, um, let me just use one of the ongoing consultations that we're just at the moment having. Um, it is a uh, conversation about promoting our role in global community. Uh, it's uh, as talked to by AIP. Um, but or you can Google it or you can Google the digital AIT. And AIT, as some of you may know, is uh, the US uh, de facto embassy uh, here in Taiwan. And so this is a, uh, I think, a, a first in public digital diplomacy uh, where two uh, countries basically uh, let the internet uh, decide the agenda for uh, the diplomatic relationships uh, for four uh, different promotions. And the, the first promotion is now a sort of the global community. And so, for example, um, someone said, you know, in Asia Pacific, um, we, we will be working many ways than before, and the relations will be more fine, I believe, and so on, not that we have an issue of the regional. And you can agree or agree with us that it's too late, I um, couldn't ensure, I hope it's ensure. Uh, and then um, you can put another state in comments. And so, and as you can see here, nothing here is, is uh, really binary. This is more a affinity or uh, resonance. By saying you agree or disagree, you are not agreeing or disagreeing with the, the entire um, assumption or the entire business. You're basically just agreeing or disagreeing on that particular way of putting it, which is why we're always using this to resonate instead of uh, just like a vote, because it's really this on a vote, this is an interactive way for people to discover their common voices. And so, while there are, of course, some controversies, like could be. Think that whenever the PRC presents Taiwan uh, on the international stage, the US should create another stage for Taiwan. Uh, and uh, A doesn't quite believe in that. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, people have uh, a lot of common analysis of the style. We can just create majority opinion and see the spectrum of uh, the consensus, like the US should hold a presidential club at the time and also um, uh, attend Taiwan's presidential act. Actually, they just delivered that uh, President Trump. Announced that President Trump on the UN side on the security department. But in any case, uh, what we're now saying is that if you look at the total reports, you see this familiar shape. And once you, if you have sufficient number of people participating in it, the likes and unlikes uh, kind of just creates a spectrum all on its own. So if you only have five people opposing with you, it's going to be very, you know, um, hard to press like or unlike, but especially like a borderline question. But you have 5,000 people, then you just Whatever you like, and at the end, you will still have a pretty clear uh, benchmark that would like to vote better for our consensus. And so, this is a technicality, but I think just the, the wider the organization is, the easier actually it will be uh, for the reference of the Right? Um, well, we're going to talk to you about sandboxes for personal gain. Um, we, we welcome uh, people to, to uh, achieve personal gain. Uh, we actually um, I just play a, a, a card game, which is a uh, card card from SDG's card game. I don't know whether you've heard of it, it's a Japanese uh, creation. Uh, and it basically um, gives everybody their personal agenda, uh, like to make a profit, or to a leisure time, or for social justice, or environmental justice, or whatever. And everybody has a set of project cards that you can invest money in, time in, and it aims you. Some money as well, and while it impacts the global score on economic and environmental and societal dimensions. What I want to get at is that um, the, the, it, the game is shaped in such a way that people are incentivized to apply the personal game. And then people are starting to realize that they cannot achieve the personal needs individually. They have to share data, they have to uh, share planning, otherwise, nobody gets anywhere because people tend to cancel each other out um, each project. So the only way to create synergy really is to play the game with the card open. You do have to actually share what you have on the hand for everybody on the same table. Otherwise, the game uh, is a no-win situation. 
which very much is how SDG is <laughs> structured. So it is really the lens of money. So if you have a local facilitator, uh, your uh, I would look on this, this game to you. But the point here is that uh, simple design, any policy design, plus start off with the innovators design of first company. Uh, it could be, you know, your products, your services, or it could be plain or whatever, right? But uh, the reason we call this is trying to be a bit of a is in exchange for the potential for their system and they to be formed to be a bit of a but it's also for a global game as well. But it's a, a kind of in a synergistic scenario that is on something that is a detection of the game. Okay. And so you are welcome to the but at the end, they have to have the design so um, consensus, and it's very hard actually when you have five ten people in all systems to have these different ideas. Um, when we did the public conversation about here, the Airbnb tried uh, like just 24 hours before the competition starts, sent a email to all the panel members asking them to come to focus and support the Airbnb um, you know, parking lot. Uh, but to, to their surprise, because this is all in case the question people can contribute their feelings as well. But only less than one third of people actually supported the uh, Airbnb size. Uh, more than two thirds of their co members uh, actually think that there is something for Airbnb to improve on and doesn't actually want just to be you know, motivated to, to place a single bit into the consultation. So I think if you allow people to express more of themselves, um, it's very, actually very hard to have this system because the natural peer pressure and so Social, um, you know, um, settings and so on will encourage people to share their more wisdom and more effective, more nuanced um, statements. And so, I think that's a good question. Uh, so, I believe the estimate here is it will cost between one and two percent of GDP, which was the best product. Um, currently, gross world product, which is the sum of all gross domestic product, is about 90 trillion dollars. So, we're talking um, somewhere around one trillion or um, dollars. I'm just going to get up here to uh, take you back to the Sustainable Development Solutions website. Um, and then we have to you can break. Or are you going to just Yeah, it does um, there's, a, there's an entire section um, on that they could be devoted to financing the SDGs. Um, so maybe on what we do. Um, well, yeah, financing for sustainable development. You go to that page, uh, you can find more of where those companies come from um, and some more specifics around financing for specific countries. Um, but I do remember uh, the estimate from Jeff Sapke somewhere around 1 to 2% of gross world product. To put that a little bit in context, the OECD countries, uh, which is a group of the most developed countries, have for years been promising. Um, a certain amount of um, domestic assistance, uh, sorry, foreign assistance um, for developing countries, and they promised on the order of uh, 27 to 1%. They have not been meeting that target, um, but they've already promised for the least developing countries alone uh, on order of 1% of GDP. Uh, so it's, it's really not much more than we've already kind of decided we want to set aside, the fire to set aside. Uh, the reality is that. The average is 0.2% that is actually given. And these are again from the richer countries. Uh, poorer countries now we're asking everyone to be on board with this. Um, and in the United States, it's going to be 0.07%. Uh, despite our goal of 0.7%. Okay. Um, so um, the next one is how do you keep the balance between stakeholders and people and making the choice that has? More social uh, impact. I think there's continuation there. Yeah. The first part is one of the other objectives of informed citizens for involving other decisions. Other popular criminals to be the best at implementation. So, um, again, I think going back to this design thing, um, the first item, the, the agenda set, I think this really is the thing. Um, the, all the policy um, crowdsourcing. One of the crowdsourcing initiatives that we have rolled out emphasize citizens' input on this stage, meaning that it's the stage where the government has no idea what to do. Right? It's an innovator that first had an idea. The regulator hasn't even seen the innovation. Um, the citizens make the implementation. The local you know, people don't uh, 
have any contact with the local city government. So when I toured to there, I said literally the first time the ministry had heard of that idea. And so when we allow similar initiatives at this moment, I think it maximizes the engagement. But of course, we're also currently working out when we're in the second environment. That is to say, the implementation, the development, and the delivery. Of course, we will need more expert input, and it's not just something that every citizen can do. But that is why we always focus on this um, what we call everyday concept of how I would question at a very middle of it. So while we can in, uh, engage a broad swath of people here and using COVID and other technologies in this location to consolidate to the how I way. We actually engage a different set of stakeholders here, and we emphasize not that much on the broad um, consultation, the broad reach or engagement, but rather on um, solid um, collaboratives or partnerships. Uh, and once we identify the kind of people in the first place that are willing to collaborate uh, across sectors, then they become the valuable partners here in the data collaboratives and the data partnerships and so on. But they are a tiny subset, a tiny slice. The original people who participate in the vision setting in the scenario plan and things like that. But still, people who participate on the first place still feel that this is part of their work. They still feel proud that their idea, their inputs have been instrumental a little in determining the high question. It's just that we make the two phase very distinct so that people don't actually overemphasize the plot on the second stage or overemphasize the technique. On the first stage, because the first stage is about the goals and values, and the second stage is about disability and protection and things like that. So, by making these two steps really clear and using different methodologies and different wordings and different ways to start your conversations, we make sure that we harness the collective intelligence on the first part and as well as the collaboration on the second part. I think that's the general outline. Of course, this is to the extent of probably I can talk about That's a general idea. So, in many countries, there are several regulations like that does which are numerous. Do you have any experience about this in Taiwan? Yes, of course. So, yeah, my, my first startup was in 1996. I was uh, 15 years old. Uh, uh, I dropped out of junior high school uh, until I featured that all the human knowledge is on the far left and all my texts were out of date. So I really mm -hmm. want to drop junior high and just start something. Uh, uh, and this is why all my teachers agree with it. So I'm very optimistic about the flexibility of bronze. <laughs> <laughs> but but at that time, really, the Taiwan uh, legal system um, doesn't reward people who use the Taiwan style. Um, in entrepreneurship uh, devices, for example, um, it's not until 2015 do we have like uh, special songs or um, things that would allow the uh, structural um, uh, structuring the board so that people can have legal um, power or things like that. And so, all the, the traditional way to incentivize um, uh, the founders so that they retain control even after series A or during series A. And things like that are just simply not the business. And so in Taiwan, people were first to start up um, companies in Cayman Islands or you know, the EU um, countries uh, to actually get access to the uh, more um, closely held uh, cooperation framework. And so when we started this public consultation process in the second of 2015, actually our very first topic how do we, how do we rewrite our company law? To be more um, acceptable to the new digital startup and entrepreneurships. Our second case is about teleworking because Taiwan had a uh, law um, that protects labor like is free, but uh, it, it's very common for women to apply to teleworking. For example, women are not supposed to work after 10 p.m., uh, but if you're teleworking, maybe that is really the, the, the time that you actually have time to start to work uh, and, and things like that. And because it was supposed to to prevent you know, security issues or you know, um, to, to, to protect the, the welfare and things like that, which is great. But in the working scenario, it really just simply doesn't make sense. But there was no system in what to be interpreted as well from this right. client in the context. And the reason why is that there was really no association of heterogeneous by one. Because there's association for every like, different trait, but heterogeneous is not a trait in itself. Or there's no association uh, of people who have human pilot. Startups, right? They, they're, they're not going to organize just because they're all regions of And so, in traditional representative 
um, or it's very really hard for them to organize and get their MPs with their voices. But because on those uh, online online and sort of publications, everybody looks for themselves and the resonating and is natural we will support even if we don't have any organizations behind it. So that people can um, represent their views and their uh, thoughts without having representatives to see on their behalf. And so after we set up those consultation platforms, all those dormant issues related to the social information now actually have a platform and we actually very quickly converged on the um, on the commodities. And so we actually did rewrite our company law and our labor law and things like that to allow for additional uh, networking and things like that. Uh, we've done some editing for all uh, past last year, and there's many other fellow boss um, that was passed over. For more information, there is this website that is maintained by the Dutch Bureau of Community called e Taiwan uh, that uh, chronicles all those different um, digital transformation issues and all the law and regulation adaptations that we have to um, do this consultation uh, and around like and really impose. Um, Data integration across different sectors, non conventional pornography, um, and, and all this, you know, challenges that is brought by the, by the internet age um, is now being discussed and using these kind of platforms. But yes, there's a lot of hindrances, but there's also ways to see some of the other companies. And um, uh, there's um, how do you see the future of work and how the state should act to quality response? Which will prepare uh, to adapt to the future of work. Um, so, this is, I'm wondering if this is a reference to the issue of artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, but I don't know if someone could add more complex questions. I, I also wanted to ask with respect to the last question uh, what, some of, what are some of the uh, hindrances to digital? The regulatory hindrances you find in there are um, to digital innovation. What, what is the question that you sorry, that. Or any one of them, yeah. So, for example, but I'm Alex Chris uh, from Social Power Party in Thailand. Uh, we have so many laws that restricted uh, the gender innovation, such as, uh, but let's say, our company law, we have exactly the same question. You cannot do the chat thing. You cannot do that. Uh, uh, share different kind of chairs, like yeah. different chairs, different chairs, special talk, special kind of talk. We don't have that. So, uh, also we have a lot of license. So most of the time, that when people, for example, like when I graduated from UC Berkeley. I came back with some of my friends and we were taking a we we saw Venmo in Berkeley, which is a such a e, e, e money e pocket, right? E wallet. And we go and ask Bank of Thailand, like, can we do that? And we just, oh you need a a capital, I mean two million dollars to run this car. And most of the time it this it, it's just this kind of license, uh company laws. And also, maybe the best way was at that time, maybe just move out of the country. But maybe when the room is before and start writing that, just those, those are just basically my experience from Thailand. Yes, sir. Anyone who wants to So then, uh, going on to the next question, I actually really appreciate the job description. Um, for the minister, the minister here, where uh, it, it emphasizes, if I'm interpreting this question correctly, um, and interpreting the definition correctly, uh, the emphasis on, uh, despite the the innovations that may come, uh, we can focus on what that does for the bottom line, which will benefit a very narrow set of stakeholders um, in the short run, but maybe not in the long run. Um, or we can make sure that we're, we're putting these um, new technologies and innovations at the service of people. Um, so we might be making conscious choices where we can use automation or artificial intelligence or robotics, um, for example, but we choose not to because we recognize that the social 
negative impacts on all of the stakeholders rather than the narrow set of stakeholders, um, but somehow be deleterious. Um, I think that's one kind of example. Of, another example is something that's now being tested, uh, which is access to some kind of basic universal income. Um, this is happening already in the state of Alaska, uh, in the United States of America, um, where each resident of Alaska, each citizen of Alaska, is guaranteed a certain um, amount of money is basically a tax refund. Um, so, so if you live in Alaska, you don't pay taxes and you actually get paid by your government. Um, and that's the shared um, wealth that is accumulating from the tourist industry in Alaska and, and other things, and that helps preserve um, some of these spaces so that um, they aren't taken over. Um, but those are, I'm not sure I'm familiar with them, but those are some examples of the future of work, especially when it comes to um, singularity and and um, the, the lack of need of human beings um, to, to do something. But, yeah, and, and on that note, I think one of the most far reaching policy is on especially curriculum. Uh, and, um, you know, just to full disclosure, before I become a fashion minister, I'm part of the K 12 curriculum uh, the world uh, And so our new curriculum, which is going to roll out this office, uh, basically shifts um, that one. From a, a traditionally more skill based education mindset, which is very common in education, uh, to um, a what we call character based um, mindset. And what, what do we mean by characters? Uh, it is three things it is autonomy, uh, it is interaction, uh, and then it is the common good. So, what we are basically saying is that previously uh, the education system emphasizes more um, building specific skills. And competing among individuals so that people uh, feel that they still have particular skills. But this is actually very dangerous because 12 years down the line, we don't know whether these skills will be so relevant. And if they are relevant, maybe they get automated. And so people who over identify on particular skills in a competitive way um, risk losing dignity uh, after 12 years because they over identify with the, the particular set of competitive skills. But these need to be rebuilt, and without the ability to be a landlord, uh, they would basically feel that they were cheated by the curriculum device. As, as a curriculum designer, I'm not going to do that. So the new curriculum uh, basically says, oh, uh, uh, if everything is, is internal, if people always feel that they're imbued with this capacity to um, be setting their own development charts using their um, preferred. Sustainable world growth, actually, uh, what kind of uh, futures of the society of the environment we want, then we can enroll them into the team of people who actually want to solve their common questions by themselves. And so instead of racing around on uh, specific tracks on um, particular skills, they're actually turning around and running to one of those common global goals and just win on the starting point. Right. Uh, and so because of that, because of that, it is a different set of uh, thinking about influence. By the time that they finish it, they build education. Basically, they can enroll into university still, but they can enroll into university now telling that they're going to program from the university social responsibility or USR, where they continue to get school credits while fixing a particular environmental or social issue locally and in the environment to the sustainability of the course. And so what we're saying basically is that the student builds their uh, dignity and their self-actualization based on the common good, then they don't actually risk um, losing their dignity with automation costs. They would think those uh, AIs are just assistive intelligences that assist them to deliver on those common values. But if they over identify on particular tasks or particular skills, then they actually lose the main method to look at a systemic um, um, holistic um, vision of the society and environments and find a ways where the machines may actually do a better job than humans. Uh, but because they will override those particular positions and risk the, the, the loss of this uh, positions of that associates with yourself. But, and so I think if we do the education design right, we will raise a generation of people who are not afraid of automation because they all have access to Java and PA and so on during their um, you know primary education. And so it's just like the technology of fire. If you used to think that uh, you know, fire is very powerful, it creates the motivation, but it's also dangerous, right? Just like AIs. Uh, it can destroy the whole species if you don't do the safety um, issues right. But the civilization code, uh, we can mention fire, 
not through restricting the body to a specific set of narrow um, takeaways. Whether we do this by democratizing by by teaching everybody to cook as early as possible, um, and along with all the health issues and habits and whatever associated with eating fine. And so if we get everybody understand that they can use an air box to become a data steward, how does it feel to be a data operator and things like that? It will then then add the right questions to the global data platform and things like that, and basically become literate and emerge in a way that prepares them for whatever it is. I see it on the bottom of the page. I think it's somewhat, uh, I can clarify their point, and I think it's probably uh, good at some of that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I'm going to repeat a little bit what I said about uh, policy versus innovation, um, and, and I'm going to apply it here to curriculum. Uh, the curriculum maybe is, is going to become less of one that is teaching specific skill sets. Um, in terms of how to code or how to computer engineer, which oftentimes would be required in, in some way, it might become more of a uh, curriculum around how to be innovative, how to be creative, um, and, and less about the specific kinds of, of, of skill sets, maybe more about the mindsets. Um, so, uh, so jumping to the next question, uh, I just want to start by, by saying, um, the disclaimer for people from public sector should not um, have you, you should not be thinking differently about innovation because we're working in the public sector environment. We need innovation in the public sector as much as in the private sector. Uh, again, the, the role that um, uh, Minister Chang is filling is extraordinarily innovative. You don't see this in uh, places on earth, and what they're doing is very innovative. Uh, but just the idea alone, um, I think it's sensitive. To emphasize that that's an example of innovation in the public sector. Um, but uh, I, I didn't explain to you the business model campus, which is something maybe we'll get into tomorrow. That's in general used for people to start thinking about startups and for profit uh, ventures, but it's very much is necessary in non profit civil society sectors and in the public sector itself. Um, so there's a firm for you know, the only difference between a, usually a government service and a Private service is that the government is providing a good that cannot be provided by the private sector because it's the public good um, or some other um, reason that we, we need it to be done at a different level or a different way. But that doesn't go over the need for innovation. Um, so I just want to make sure that your mindsets are, you know, how do we be uh, thinking of yourselves as somehow separate um, from that? So I'll, I'll let Bob read and take the rest of it. That's great. Um, so, so I think the, the business model of Canvas. Is, is very useful in analyzing all these things as well. I mean, the only difference is that just as you have observed, this for many of the government services, there really is no alternative. So we have to take in mind uh, the kind of structural injustices we can create, whereas in the private sector, the user can just push to another method, the user's injustice being done to them or systemic discrimination of bias in the government setting is much harder. So, so I think um, just the social justice part needs to be put into much higher weight uh, compared to the private sector, but otherwise it's very similar. Um, and so uh, my theory of change uh, actually is very simple. In the public sector, we usually are motivated uh, by reasons. First, we want to raise efficiency, certainty, and quality of service, and so we want to lower the cost and increase the efficiency. And the second thing is well, we want to reduce the risk. It could be a risk of a meltdown of the industry, right? It could be a public risk, but it can also be a systemic risk for the society. And as public service, we would be safeguard to provide a bedrock that prepares the society to absorb risk. And that's our second which is risk innovation. Our third, of course, is our personal achievement, right? It's uh, we have credit for the great work that we have done and things like that. And the, the, and the problem with a uh, kind of um, ministerial position is that too often, if I don't do anything special, usually I get all the credit if things go wrong. And the public service gets all the blame if things go wrong. And it's very unfair. And, and which is why I practice uh, radical transparency. So I just want to uh, encourage you to think about radical transparency, not necessarily about something. But what I have discovered is that just by saying that after the condition, I have chaired 892 meetings uh, or accepted interviews or lobbying. Uh, and I talked to almost 4,000 people of all the 
speeches, uh, and it's not just you know summaries of meetings. It is actually a very um, detailed, like who exactly said what, where, um, when, um, recordings, so that you can almost reconstruct the entire conversation just by looking at the transcript. And um, there's a link you can just have one author as quote and discuss it on social media and things like that. And so in this regulatory transparent setting, what I have discovered is that it actually incentivized the whole public service to innovate. Because now if they innovate, actually they get the credit. Because the journalists, the public can go back and see who we found in the public journals that creates such an innovative idea. And because there's only in the you know, world they exist. <laughs> so, so I absorb a lot of things go wrong, and I absorb a lot of parts. <laughs> and so that, that makes it much easier for people to do it. And while we do this with education and credit attribution, we make sure that whatever we do is a parental improvement in the sense that we don't trade one of the three values for the other, which is what's in the locals. That's true of what we want, right? So we don't propose something that can not credit, but at a you know, sacrifice. Of risk. We don't do something to avoid the political risk by at a second point of certainty or efficiency uh, of service. So we can only do piecemeal in piece of, but without detrimental impact on any of the few other bottom lines. And once we commit ourselves to only do such uh, what we call credit improvements, then suddenly people are very, very free to compare it because they know that if they propose something that is a true device, everybody will really know because they work out loud and it's a very good transparency model. And so my office is literally one person coach from each ministry. So we have 32 ministries here. So I can have at most 32 colleagues at moment. I have 21 colleagues. Uh, this is not going to be one of my office. <laughs> and so each ministry is a different value. If someone proposes something so that it will be detrimental to some other values, the people in the other ministry tell it in my office. For them to let them know. And that is how we keep delivering innovations that are at least not sacrificing uh, anyone. And I think that can promote innovations to practice in the public sector because the career public service doesn't do great things by any amount of data might be that would be or already a lot of consensus would be about the same time as the one that results the reasoning. So first I I I'd say that because of the format. Um, in innovation, such as Slido, we tend to get to almost all the questions that are posed of the speaker in the class. Um, and it's really remarkable. I mean, what's the real main benefit of doing this in the global classroom? You have someone like Jeff Stein, someone like the Open Classroom, where you have access to have a dynamic interaction with them as opposed to someone who needs to go down one the show, um, and they will get to it. Um, if they don't get to it, we encourage you to reach out to them. Directly. And because you have this shared experience with them, they're much more likely to respond to it than if you just cold call or, or you know them. Um, finally, at the end of the course, we do take suggestions, and, um, and we do listen to the feedback we get. Um, part of the reason why half our speakers are confirmed and half aren't is because we are trying, we, we ask, you know, who are the best for the work? Who do you recommend we bring into this here? And then sometimes it's a vague kind of person, sometimes it's a specific person. Um, I, Happy to say that we got tons of positive feedback about Audrey's uh, lecture, and therefore we were able to confirm Audrey for next year. Um, those we have less enthusiastic support for, we may not have been in back. Um, and we received suggestions from people like uh, Kiva uh, and others who bring that up, the new flow, who are bringing these kind of counter alternative perspectives to maybe the traditional step back here for us um, that's, that's kind of run through this network. Um, so we do incorporate it. There, there is a dynamic kind of feedback we incorporate it because that make it a um, little different than when you're asking for one of the So the next question is how important it is to offer the democratic or dictator regimes uh, by bringing technology and solutions. They can use this aid against yeah, so I, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about the role of technology and the two edged sort of technology. Where the technology itself is, is neutral, it can be for good or for bad, or sometimes both at the same time, um, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. Um, uh, I made fun of Uber earlier, we also like to make fun of Twitter. 
um, because it seems so silly and simple, and um, and yet uh, it had it entered a non-democratic regime, um, many of them, and, and helped topple those non-democratic regimes um, in, in kind of an unexpected, uh, amazing way. Um, so that's all I really have to share about that. Uh, it is because it is tricky. Um, technology can be used for, for bad or for good. I think um, what maybe what Audrey would talk to you about the more open the data is, and the more we can ensure that people, right, the, the data or the technology is the more we can ensure that people have access to it, um, so that the dictators are just switching off the internet um, when it's convenient. Um, I think then there's more power um, for it to be potentially leveraged for good, and, and maybe it's just the, the users themselves are helping ensure that it's used for good. Thank you. I, I still remember when Taiwan was not in democracy. Uh, and I'm very used to it. Um, so, um, like people younger than me assume that Taiwan is always in a democracy because they don't, uh, they don't really um, have their personal experience of going to read it with their platforms. But it, it's not the same as having lived through the martial law days uh, where there really wasn't much of a freedom of assembly or expression and people get do get to hear and, and things like that. And so having lived through the martial law and also the living the martial law and the 10 years or so of this civil society building itself and finally led right to the presidential election in the 1996 and also the popularization of the Y1, which is around 10 years. Um, and I think I can say that it is by far not the state to state technology channel that enabled the democratization of Taiwan. It is rather because as we have observed that the general availability of personal the general availability of personalized empowerment technologies, this um, you know, digital and social technologies that enables the NPOs here, the civil society people here, the people who um, basically advocate for human rights and things like that, to get a different set of what you can see, um, enabling apparatus by enabling them to talk directly to the people and get people's consensus and be managed uh, for them to be um, a uh, um, popular, including protests, but also with performance uh, propositions, and finally get into the place where. The state authority see all this difference, so around the people finally decide that it actually is maybe a better path to go democratic. And so, I think creating the necessary conditions for a democratic to function is paramount if there is no uh, sustainable um, civil society to be ready to take on the governmental functions. There is no social entrepreneurship and things like that. Then it's too easy for the authorities to say that people are not ready for democracy. They, they may say it's in theory. Uh, and, and so, just by empowering the people directly through open innovation, we create a precondition that allows democracy to happen. And of course, I'm not a blind because I'm not saying democracy must happen when you fulfill the preconditions, but at least we need to prepare the preconditions. Um, I think Thailand is a pretty good example. <laughs> And this is a, a more popular question. <clears throat> Governance usually is about creating asymmetries right, through the many pillars, information asymmetries. And radical transparency is simply about how to do that because it makes them question harder. And so, how do we see the future of governance? Um, so, the, the way I, I participate uh, in this kind of uh, open governance, I didn't invent any of it myself. Uh, I participated in the Governance of the internet when I was 15 years old, and uh, I was taken to another five years uh, to from the two star voting and things like that. So, so it's my, my indigenous time <laughs> the, the internet governance uh, facility and like internet engineering task force and so on. Um, and so, the internet governance is a hinge on the techniques that you really cannot do wireless, um, right? If, if somebody don't adopt your internet standard, if somebody a browser then that doesn't upgrade your browser to digital equipment or things like that, there really is no way to coalesce that into action. And so people really have to figure out what we call broad consensus to move anything forward. And so there's a particular set of dominant techniques that has grown out of this non coercive and artistic nature of how internet works. And so now, of course, it's starting to intersect with the real politics by essentially having to first translate into regulations 
uh, Uber is a great example, actually, uh, people start to see this uh, code as well, uh, installments from the early, um, you know, basically a political uh, everyday things like doing home sale or hiring a car or things like that. And so I think by necessity, people have to now uh, gain legitimacy through openness simply because the alternate way is to maintain the same distance to the people. And then people who may do it in social media or whatever to present this information to create fear and uncertain campaigns, populism or whatever, they already mastered uh, the technique of just harnessing into the collective uh, fears and doubt and whatever uh, unconsciousness um, um, tendencies. And so it really there is no other way but for governments to adopt the same closeness to people by responding in and out and basically making the rumors about having no room to spread. Because otherwise, the rumors always have a little spread. The only alternative, of course, is to basically shut down the internet and come in China and it's a normal jurisdiction in China anyway. But that is, uh, to my opinion, not the sustainable way of doing this. Uh, I think the next question would be for me. Uh, it's probably related to the question about how much the FCC is going to cost. I'm going to say something good about the results. I'm going to say something maybe bad about the politics in my response. But let me start by saying the figure of the 1.2% of GDP going towards spending to achieve the SDG, and that's per year, by the way, so it's accumulated. Um, I do not think that there were you know, ledgers in there for uh, consultants. So that's not part of that figure. Um, Here's what I'll say that's good about consultants. Uh, you know, management consulting, for example, is, is are, are people who are being hired by Fortune 500 companies to make, and, and they're being hired at quite a cost. So they are having a positive role. So there is a role for consultants. Uh, human resources is extraordinarily important um, when it comes to uh, to project management, um, to efficiency gains. Um, so there is a role for consultants. Um, and I, I don't think we necessarily want to completely separate that out um, as always something to be avoided. Um, that said, how many of you are familiar with, uh, so we have a sustainable development goal, how many of you are familiar with Millennium Development Goals that preceded it? Um, and how about the Millennium Village is Anybody familiar with that? Okay. So let me talk just a little bit about that. The Millennium Village's Villages Project is a proof of concept for the Millennium Development Goals that if we could direct that 0.7% of GDP uh, per person and achieve the one development goal, um, which were only eight and close to that. Uh, but most were focused on, on social and health. Um, so they, so the, uh, the UN, um, the Jeffrey Sachs, um, who is one of my mentors and I never been a little critical of him, they selected 12 villages across different agro ecological zones in Sub Saharan Africa. Um, those are the initially 5,000 people and then clustered to as many as 55,000 people. And what they tried to show is that per person, we're spending what we said we would spend. And, and in these communities, by spending that amount, we are achieving the development goals. That was the whole uh, in, in motivation for the one building project as a proof of concept. And there's questions whether it, it succeeded in this or not. Uh, but my main challenge with this, criticism of this, um, is that the funding didn't include the project managers, who were some of the most unique talent to look at the country, uh, which is another thing about consultancy. Keep in mind that a lot of consultants these days aren't coming from developed countries or from developing countries. They're usually partnering with developing countries, helping um, identify the best talent and train that talent. Um, but they were directing some of the best talent in managing the localized project. But to whatever success they had, I always questioned the ability to scale that. Um, one, they weren't really including it in their budget. And it was a huge, it, it, as I said in the first part of the conference, it was an important budget, it was huge, but it wasn't counted, and then too how do you replicate that um, across you know, a, a, an entire country? Um, they struggled when they tried to, to scale the one and really count it within a certain country, so partly for that reason. Um, so then I kind of interpreted that question a little broadly about so no, I don't think it's in that number, in that figure, but that said, maybe it should be, because there are going to be times when we need, um, we need expertise, and we need a few kinds of things to be made. Um, oftentimes, with people from the country, which is a positive thing, um, but then, you know, are we kind of missing the bigger question of how do we really achieve these kind of, you know, can we prove something on a small scale where it would require a much 
for the kind of human resource variation talking about the other problems. Right, and the next question is, do you think there is a case of ethics of AI and the work that we want to do? Well, there, there, there really is. What, what the mind of my personal name doesn't matter at all. The, the whole point of having the social relation part of having those social individuals is that it's designed to can figure out the law through interactions instead of abstract thinking. This is important because um, in the local um, surveys and the real interactions we have gathered, there is a different set of priorities and it even changes depending on the cities or counties. Uh, counties that you are in. In Taiwan, generally speaking, people prefer the autonomous vehicles to prioritize the most, to heal the most to the elderly, uh, and then to the women, and then to the people with disabilities, and finally the children. But if you ask people from Boston or MIT in Taiwan, they prefer the autonomous vehicles to heal the children. They don't quite care about the other. Uh, and so, because of that, um, I mean, this is, I think, is a part of this uh, position that the uh, downtown and Japan shares uh, in our management school in that the prioritizing of the uh, But in any case, I think, um, so what I'm saying is that the ethics is a reflection of the societal ethics. It is not an ethics that you can calculate abstractly. It has to be formed through the norms that is co created by the social interaction. With the actual innovations on AI. And so we always prefer a norm first approach. And with the norms, we introduce regulations sometimes through examples. And using the regulations, then we talk about the parameters that design the boundaries of AI, the line of AI, that is the actual software that uh, And you open is the other way around. Right? You first have the code, and the code uh, lobbies and gets the regulation that they want. And the regulation then dictates the design the norm. And you get all those different demands uh, from the same scenario. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, <laughs> but if people consistently adopt, adopt a norms first approach, a local norms first approach, then I think a lot of the community disadvantages can be picked up here. Was well, your experience when it comes to collaborate with NGOs or NGOs? How do you make sure your idea has to work? Is a new question. All right. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> right. So, um, the nonprofit organization. Oh. Right. Um, so, I think um, my, my experience is this is really complicated. And I think this is uh, a necessity. When I say we, we can't be them, we must join them. Uh, we would be in literally. Because in, in Taiwan, uh, we are very, uh, as I said, fortunate to have a democratization that is led by the civil society and the NGOs. And so, uh, for example, the, the, back to this book of you, uh, the NGO that produces uh, the Children Art Foundation or Care Arts Foundation, uh, or as the is in a way, is a professional foundation for people with Down syndrome. And they're around for 30 years, I think. Um, and they're, they're more legitimate than pretty much any of the government programs. And we can use many other examples. A very popular fantastic group foundation called CC Charity uh, Foundation here. If they publish a number and the government published another number, you are going to trust the CC number when it comes to that as a relief because they simply have one talk to the legitimacy. They all of them were founded around or even before the, the first presidential election. And so people generally trust that more uh, out there with policy. And so basically I I'm, I always say that I'm just a good channel. Upon which the NGOs, even the social sector, including social enterprises, and social enterprises, can just get their agenda into the governance mechanism. It's never the other way around because we trust the NGOs are the last mile deliver us and they have a better idea of the local agenda as compared to the government. But what does this let uh, the government do? Well, just we're back to the accountability part. We make sure that everybody has the same access to the same numbers. As evidenced by, for example, the how economic and social uh, analysis system, the census. That is our kind of contribution to the NGOs. All those different counties, all those different um, precincts, or whatever, we share the same numbers on population, income, economy, industry, transportation, land, housing, education, uh, and people can just highlight a um, 
problem of course of the wine population or you know a migration a net migration out of that particular county and things like that and compare it with your uh, nearby counties and everything like that so basically we're we see ourselves as creating a checklist space where those NGOs can deliver meaningfully on the different path forward for that particular county or that particular prison. But the bottom up still is still there. Whatever the agenda they have, it's through multi sectoral planning sessions that the government facilitates, but never controls. And so this uh, dedication to a civil society plus uh, development agenda, I think, is quite unique in Taiwan. And I think our relationship with the NGO and is the basis of this mutual trust. If we deviate from that path, then of course you run the translation probably for one. But because my agenda are literally all created by the NGOs, uh, that is makes it themselves the kind of translator of those ideas back to the uh, society. And that actually is the main difference between the uh, because the symbols are co created by the NGOs, they serve as co and translators back to their influences that we've done on that channel. Sure, as long as now that I know the NGO, <laughs> for some reason we don't use that terminology. Very good. We can say that. Um, so, I, I, back to my, my earlier point about uh, you not separating yourself from public sector versus private sector, you would be innovative. Uh, and the business model, Canvas, being able to apply not just to a, a startup or a private sector company, but should be something that can be nicely organized uh, for any organization that's somehow self-sustaining, uh, somehow successful. What I would say is it's easier for an NGO or an NPO to continue to exist when maybe it doesn't have a truly impactful or sustainable model than it is for a private sector company, um, which would go out of business if it wasn't somehow serving its clients' needs. Um, and this is because some of the business models of NGOs and NPOs Views are um, from the benevolent funders who maybe aren't um, keeping close attention or maybe aren't so concerned with the innovation level. Um, that said, uh, you know, a very successful NGO is the Red Cross. And what's the Red Cross in business model? We raise money and then we apply it to disaster relief situations, and they do it in a way that governments aren't able to do, but intergovernmental agencies sometimes are able to do it. It's very successful. Um, is it particularly innovative? No. Um, but is it doing an amazing job having made an impact? Yes. Um, that said, um, in Haiti, after the earthquake, um, there was a time where the government had to kick out all NGOs. Because there were too many people were misdirected funds. People were using the um, situation of the earthquake in Haiti to, to raise tremendous amount of money and request people where and how that was going to uh, those in need. Um, they actually kicked everyone out and made that they apply. Um, I think that's a great idea for all countries. <laughs> um, on some level, um, uh, is to really kind of have to prove what you're doing and why you're doing it, how you're doing it. Um, to be careful that when there is some kind of um, very visible uh, um, problem that it's not being uh, misused or abused. Um, I also remember traveling in Southeast Asia. Uh, there would be full page newspaper ads saying, "Don't donate to the orphans." <laughs> because they're not actually using that money for orphans or, or, or not breaking down, or people are actually you know, essentially congregating these kids in a situation they don't want to be in. Um, so I think it, it's mixed with, with NGOs, where it's you know, the, the challenge of remaining profitable for a for profit is usually not the ones who can cut it. Um, so the, the experience of NGOs or NGOs has really been, been mixed, and sometimes that enters into the I do a lot of work with social entrepreneurs, social ventures. I can enter into there too, um, where, where some ideas may be more uh, well thought out than others, uh, and, and somehow the, the less well thought out ones are still attracting some kind of investment. Yeah, Jeff, you want to add anything? So, in, in addition to presence, which is uh, all you know, objective uh, information about localities. But we now are working on a uh, social innovation database um, that basically uh, classifies the priorities that each Taiwan cities and counties have. You know that they are as each COVID. I think it's good to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could do is you will um, see exactly what kind of SDGs 
the county or city is focusing on and in their area, what are the social enterprises or social ventures um, solving these uh, SDGs? And also, you can browse across all the SDGs to see uh, over Taiwan what kind of social entrepreneurs are working on our local innovation organization or SIOs uh, are working on these SDGs. But uh, the point I want to get across uh, is that not all, of, not all of them are NGOs. Some of them are our voluntary companies. But what we basically have is for a company to be listed here, you have to provide an accountable um, like mission in your charter, uh, in your charter documents of the company. You have to yearly disclose your revenue reports in order to qualify to list in the database. On the other hand, if you're an NGO, then you're uh, also required to uh, list the part of how you plan to deliver those impact, sometimes via yeah, services and products, but sometimes just by rate of but actually providing the same accountability frame as at any um, you know, company that declares that you're acting for the So it doesn't quite matter where, whether you're a CEO or a company that is incorporated or something like that. But what really matters is the kind of accountability that one can provide to the whole society so that we can discover each other based on the SDGs and know that if you select quality education, then all these different NGOs and NGOs are solving more or less the same issues, the same common goals, while you can be assured more or less that at least in the previous fiscal year that they did when they declared that they want to do, which is uh, achieving quality education. And so having this national accountability awareness, I think, is also the key to building this solidarity on the NGOs because previously we don't have to come on top of it, but now we have Really helpful. You just use the SDGs that you call the catalog. I think we're down to the last question. Um, so, what is the biggest challenge I face as a technology leader that pushes content information? Well, there's not much that does this systems really. Uh, I think a lot of it is just people um, hearing that having a information partly transparent will make the society panic. Uh, I will use a example about Taiwan's um, um, land use map. In the Taiwan land use map, actually, it's part of the census that I just showed you. Uh, there used to be a data set that publishes the risk of a landfall, of a, a, like a, a crashing tsunami, how it could uh, affect your local land after uh, a earthquake or things like that. Basically, the risk of that disaster uh, to your land. But because it was published in a really coarse grain way, in the sense that it's published down to the resolution of one particular block. So, so it actually affects the, the health part of the of a, a larger than expected area. Because people look at the coarse grain and compare it to the block, and they think that it could be affected, and then it led to kind of panic. But the response to that, of course, is on taking that even bit down. It's actually the city government and municipal governments making extra surveys and publish a very fine resolution. Uh, map that actually details which exact buildings are subject to those risks uh, and things like that. So it won't have the negative uh, unnecessary externalities, but it requires a culture of the public service and that, okay, maybe we, we publish this without you know, consulting with the brokers and so on, and we will do that the next time. And basically, the solution to such fears and setting them down is deepening the relationship of public and publishers. It's never the reach, retracing or the unpublishing of data, and then that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it's more fun. Before we wrap up, if I could quickly uh, pull the, the, the classroom here for tomorrow, I, I had that last slide where I was hoping we could somehow find out the specific <laughs> indicators. I don't think we'll get to all the um, can, I, can I just do a quick few questions to the class to see your familiarity with the two concepts so I can decide how much time to spend on them tomorrow? Um, planetary boundaries, uh, please raise your hand if, you, if you've been exposed to those and feel like you really understand them well. Okay, good. I'll go to that tomorrow. Um, and then, if, so now I'm going to ask about um, with respect to like the, the, the category of SDG, the one that is maybe to the extent to which you feel it's relevant to like. In your country. So, um, health, how many of you is health uh, kind of directly relevant? Okay. A few hands. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and raise your hand if there's any doubt, raise your hand. Um, so, let's do health again. Education. 
uh, gender equality, um, climate change, um, ocean, uh, biodiversity laws, and urbanization. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. 